Sharon Davis, MBE, joins me now. Hi, Sharon. Good evening, Mark. Oh, I'm better going to sit down after all that. It was the fact that you actually mentioned all the years, which is really depressing. <laughs> no, listen, I can't believe what you've packed, packed into the decades and you are still the picture of health ever youthful. Can you remember the first time you were in a pool? Oh, um, yeah. You know, on the BBC, when they have that Lido right at the front of Plymouth Ho, you know, the big circular yes. one. They play the yeah, drum. yeah. Yes. That's where I learned to swim in that pool because that's where I come from. I come from Plymouth and my dad was Navy. So I was always near the water, always in the water. Um, and by the time I was about eight or nine, everything else that I did kind of dropped away and I was training every day. So, yeah, it was, um, you know, water's definitely in my blood, I think. And did you have certain physical attributes? I mean, were you a gifted athlete that suited you to swimming or was it more your mentality? It's definitely both. Um, you know, if you're going to be competing with the best in the world, you've got to physiologically be the right shape and size. You're never going to get a, a six foot two gymnast or, you know, a five foot three basketball player. So swimmers are quite a tall breed. We tend to have long arms. We tend to have big feet and big hands. It sounds really attractive, um, <laughs> but that's our paddles. And so, you know, everyone that will be in an Olympic final will be of that kind of shape. And if you look at someone like Rebecca, Rebecca's about five foot 11. I used to be five foot 11. I don't think there's a female under six foot that's in the final of the 100 meters freestyle. So yeah, that's, that's kind of where we're at. And what about that mentality, particularly when you were competing at the elite level? I mean, how did you manage the nerves? You, it builds up, so you do get used to it. You know, obviously you start competing at, at club level and then it goes to city level and county level and, you know, West County level and then national and the whole thing just kind of grows and grows and you just learn to cope with it. But obviously you do get nervous, you know, absolutely. I mean, if someone had given me the out just before the Olympic final back in 1980, you know, I would have probably locked myself in the bathroom and stayed there. Once the gun goes and you're racing, then all those nerves actually go and you just go into automatic mode. But, but it is a very nervous thing. And, and part of my guess of being a, a, a champion is being able to cope with that, that nervous energy and that expectation. And that's why someone like Adam is so amazing, you know, because yeah. not only is he an Olympic champion, he's, a, he's come back and won it for the second time when there is so much expectation and pressure on him. It's much easier to become an Olympic champion than it is to retain that Olympic championship. What's the hardest thing about competing in swimming? Uh, just being wet, really. I mean, I was a very, very clean child, I have to say. I was always thinking of chlorine, which going through buckets of cocoa butter and, and hair moisturiser all the time. Um, but, you know, it was t on the on the genuine side, it was quite antisocial. So I was doing six hours a day, two hours in the pool in the morning, two hours again in the evening and then two hours of lamb work. So as a, you know, as a teenager, it doesn't leave you a lot of free time. And silly stuff like watching last night's TV programs when you go to school become very important at the time. Obviously, now they're very unimportant, but you don't feel like you're fitting in. Um, luckily for me, I was, I suppose I was always looking towards the bigger picture. And my parents are very good at, at being able to do that for me. And I wanted to win. You know, there's no doubt about it. That's got to be something that's there. You can't put that absolute desire to be the best, to give things up, to train really hard to learn from every time that something doesn't work out, that you go back and you train a bit harder. So, you know, that's got to be a bit of a, an instinct, I think. And what about representing your country at the Olympics? Tell me about the emotions involved. Just hugely proud. I mean, you know, on my bi biography, on my Twitter, it's the first thing I say, very proud Brit. And I am, I'm a very, very proud Brit. I love standing underneath the Union Jack. I'm very proud of my country and, and the people that are in it. Um, and so I was always very proud of being part of the British team at the Olympic Games. And I did my first games at 13 and then I won my medal four years later. And then I had a sort of enforced eight years away because we had no trust funds in, in swimming at that time, even though they had them in track and field. And then I came back and competed in the 92 Olympic Games when I was nearly 30. So, yeah, for me, Tokyo was my 12th Olympic Games. And I've, uh, I've always felt very privileged to, to be involved. You know, my life sort of goes in four year cycles. It's remarkable. Where are the medals? Ah, where are the medals? Actually, they're tucked away somewhere or other. Yeah, I mean, I do take them out and about. You know, when I visit schools and things, I, I, I let the kids pick them up and look at them because I think that it's really important that they can see that we all came from the same place that they did. You know, I started off as 
as a little girl down in Plymouth who rode ponies and went swimming and wasn't anything particularly special, just a very normal little girl who just had opportunity and worked very hard. And so that's, yeah, that's, that's very important message. So the medals go out, go out and about. And you mentioned children. How important is the provision of swimming pools for children and young people? And how do we compare, Sharon, to elsewhere in Europe or the States? That's an amazing question, actually, Mark, because we, we've lost so far 250 pools in England alone since the beginning of COVID. So a lot of local authorities used it as an excuse to run down facilities and then not reopen them. Now, you know, swimming, being able to swim is probably the only sport that actually can save a life. Um, unless maybe you're running away from a tiger. But, you know, ultimately we have lots of seas and rivers and quarries and and our kids need to be able to swim. Not only is it a lifesaver, it's a skill that you can have for life that you can do right up until, you know, from cradle to to grave. So terribly important that our kids can be able to swim and and a very social family activity as well. Um, So that's very worrying. And in fact, Swim England are are predicting at the moment that by the end of this decade, we'll have lost 2,000 swimming pools in the UK. And the thing is, we weren't doing, Sharon, we weren't doing brilliantly before the pandemic, were we, compared to countries like France, Germany and the US? No, absolutely. You know, we're we're one of the only countries in sort of what we call the Western world that doesn't have mandates that says that says we have to have leisure facilities, including swimming pools, to look after our communities and to keep them fit. Mm. And the one thing that COVID has shown us that it's terribly important that we are as fit as we possibly can be so that we can take responsibility for our own health. And and it gives us a better chance of being able to, to fight off things like COVID. So I, I work with a company called Paragon, uh, and we're now looking at bringing in um, tent stud sort of buildings from North America, which are already very, very popular in North America, as you mentioned. And we can build leisure facilities in the UK for about a tenth of the price of the old fashioned kind of structures that are basically coming to the end of their life now. So mm. that's something I'm quite excited about as well. Because if you ask me if there was one thing that I'm really passionate about, obviously apart from loving my swimming and my swimmers, it would be about trying to get people healthier and fitter and kids swimming. Well, that's right. Uh, you've got your website at Sharon Davies Fitness. Yeah, so you can find Sharon Davis Fitness on SharonDavis.com. Um, I've been putting that together for about a year. Obviously, now we've, we've been working from home. Sadly, if you look at um, health clubs, we're still not back to the numbers that we were before pre-COVID. So people have decided that they do want to, to work out more at home. So I thought, well, how can I design a program that can be the minimum amount of time that people can spend exercising? Because the first excuse is that we haven't got time, which isn't always true, but it is, it's the reason people give. Another one is cost, so it's the price of a cup of coffee a week. Um, and the other one is, will I get results? And it's absolutely, you will get results. You know, it takes about three months to make or break a habit. So you do have to stick at something. But this is a program where you can work out with me four times a week and, and um, make a real difference. And the website is SharonDavies.com or just Google Sharon Davies with two R's. Sharon, before you go, the clock's against us. But um, look, I know that you're super pro-trans, you know, uh, you're a very, very tolerant and um, embracing person of of all lifestyles. Um, But you you have spoken out about trans women participating in female sport. And what is your view on that one? So it's not just trans women that that are sort of the the issue. It's also trans men, to be honest with you, which are obviously females that are transitioning and taking testosterone. So if they were to compete in in the female category, the women's category, they wouldn't be able to, they'd be disqualified. So it's about finding solutions that everybody can do sport. You know, you're absolutely right. It has to be inclusive. However, it does also have to be fair. So the reason we have categories in sport, whether that's male and female races, whether that's the under 10s versus the under 15s, whether that's the heavyweights versus, versus the flyweights is to create fair competition. Now, the difference between male and female performance is between 10 and 30 percent, which is absolutely huge. And I suppose one of the reasons I'm I'm outspoken is because I went through the East German era where so many of us lost out on our medals to the the, the sort of um, East German doping program that was going on in the 70s and and the 80s. And they were able to produce through the use of testosterone through through puberty about a 9 percent advantage. Now, in the 1980 Olympics, where I won my silver medal, They won 97 of the 102 medals that were available in the swimming pool in the women's events. And yet nobody went, oh, that's a bit weird. And they won one in the men's. So 
so many women lost out on those those potential medals. Um, I mean, I was lucky. I, I, I beat two. I had a silver medal. It's given me an opportunity to have a career. There are British girls that came fourth behind three East Germans that no one's ever heard of who would have been Olympic champion, and their whole lives would have been different. So I just don't want to see another generation of young girls miss out on, on what should be theirs. It's not a matter of wanting to ban anybody. It's about people competing in the right category and and we need to maybe create an open category so that trans men and trans women are welcome to compete in that category and then a protected female category so that half of this world get the right to equal opportunities in sport what a great solution sharon it's been fantastic to have you on the program we haven't had a chance to talk about your amazing tv career loved you on gladiators and the big breakfast Uh, perhaps you'll come and join us on the sofa for our panel when you're in the capital I love to. Now that life is coming back to normal and there's so many people on that panel I admire. So fantastic. And well done to you at GB News, because I know you're going from strength to strength. Oh, well, thank you. That's uh, very high praise coming from you, Sharon. Look forward to catching up really soon. Sharon Davies, MBE, no less. 